thank you all uh, for giving me the opportunity to come and present uh, here today at this webinar. I'm delighted to share some of our research findings with you. The topic of today's webinar really brings together two different issues that have been typically discussed in different literatures and different communities of practice. On the one hand, uh, the issue of land governance, uh, including uh, in relation to the recent wave of large-scale land acquisitions for agribusiness investments, and the, uh, and the uh, area of international investment treaties. Uh, and what I'm going to argue is that connecting the two, making the links that exist uh, between these two uh, issues uh, can unlock insights for better policy, both on uh, land rights and governance and on international investment treaties. Um, as Mathieu also mentioned, I'm going to draw primarily on two reports that ID published last year, uh, both on the topic um, being discussed here, one being more of a legal analysis of uh, the uh, treaties and how they've been interpreted over the years, uh, and I'll be drawing primarily on this, uh, the other being more of a quantitative effort to assess the extent to which um, investment treaties protect uh, deals concluded in the recent wave of agribusiness investments, and I'd like to acknowledge that the latter report is being co-authored by my colleague Thierry Berger. Uh, both reports are primarily concerned with uh, low- and middle-income countries, which is going to be the focus of uh, 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 my presentation as well, uh, while also recognizing that in different ways, both sets of issues, that is land rights and governance on the one hand and investment treaties on the other, are equally relevant uh, to higher income countries too. A few words about land rights and governance to start. Uh, I think it's uh, hard to uh, overstate uh, how important uh, land is uh, in uh, many low- and middle-income countries, not only uh, in an economic or socioeconomic sense uh, as a basis for livelihoods and food security, but also uh, uh, in socio-cultural and even spiritual, spiritual terms as a source of value, identity, and in many places land is also a basis for um, the collective sense of justice um, based on historical uh, historical experiences that different countries may have had. Uh, at the same time, uh, while being an, uh, a, a very important development issue, uh, land is also typically a very difficult uh, development issue uh, to deal with, uh, partly because pressures on land uh, have been growing, particularly valuable lands in many contexts as a result of uh, uh, diverse drivers, both uh, exogenous and endogenous, so uh, both specific to uh, some given localities and are driven by external factors, national to global factors. And in particular, in recent years, there's been much debate about a new wave of large-scale land acquisitions uh, for agribusiness investments, in, in uh, particularly in Africa, but also in uh, uh, in um, uh, Southeast Asia, in, in Latin America, and other parts of the developing world. So many, uh, many uh, difficult issues to deal with, uh, very much specific to each context. Uh, land rights are very often insecure, uh, partly depending on the context, partly because of a mismatch between uh, national level legislation, national policy on the one hand, and local practice, customary systems that may or may not enjoy uh, adequate recognition in, in uh, national uh, governance systems. Um, Elsewhere, um, uh, highly inequitable distribution uh, patterns uh, may, be, may be an issue. Uh, quite often, um, in, in conflict situations, land may be an important uh, factor, both as a driver of the conflict and as a, an element of post-conflict um, uh, solutions. Uh, land issues also within uh, families within households in terms of gender and generation. Uh, so a, a wide range of difficult development issues for which now uh, there is much greater consensus at the international level on, on, uh, on ways to tackle uh, these issues. At the global level, the voluntary guidelines um, endorsed by the Committee on Food Security back in 2012 are a, a key reference point, uh, but there are also regional instruments, uh, particularly in the context of Africa, the African Union framework and guidelines on land on land policy. Uh, 
uh, so a difficult issue, an important issue, uh, and also an issue for which there is uh, 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 an increasingly clear sense of direction in terms of what needs to happen in order to promote more responsible land governance. Uh, this covers issues uh, as diverse as uh, strengthening uh, security of tenure, uh, dealing with issues such as land re redistribution or land restitution, uh, and also tightening standards in investment processes. And as I mentioned, the recent wave of uh, land-based investment has been a key driver in the development of international uh, guidance uh, on, on land governance. Um, and what I would like to flag here is that measures to implement uh, this guidance that has been developed at the international level could have adverse uh, financial implications for businesses. For example, in relation to uh, tighter standards in investment processes, uh, the voluntary guidelines uh, refer to uh, consultation and in the context of indigenous peoples, free prior informed consent, they refer to compensation standards, they refer to environmental um, uh, standards, they refer to labor uh, issues and clearly tightening standards in each of these arenas could potentially increase costs for businesses that have been uh, operating um, uh, uh, um, on, in, in the agricultural sector. So then I would like to move on to the other uh, 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 part of the equation, which is the uh, international frameworks that um, uh, relate more directly to uh, investments, and particularly foreign investments, uh, which would include, as we will see, uh, the agriculture sector and land-based investments. Now, in the area of trade, um, there are many bilateral and regional trade agreements, but there is also a global level multilateral system centered in the WTO, the World Trade Organization. In relation to investment in particular, there isn't an equivalent uh, multilateral uh, arrangement. Rather, there are uh, over 3,000 uh, bilateral regional treaties. The formulations of these treaties can vary quite significantly, so each treaty needs to be assessed in its own right. But equally, there are some recurring features that enable uh, discerning some, 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 some common uh, trends in this uh, landscape of uh, investment treaties. Um, and a recurring feature, or in fact, the key recurring feature, is that these treaties aim to promote investment between two or more countries, and they do that through establishing legal safeguards for the protection of foreign investment against um, adverse action that the host state may take vis-à-vis uh, -vis that investment. Uh, the assumption being that if, uh, if an investor is reassured that they will reap the benefits of their investment, then they will be more inclined, they will have a greater incentive to invest. And so investment treaties, despite much uh, variety in formulations, they quite often include clauses, for example, that uh, set uh, conditions for the legality of expropriations, enable, uh, require states to enable investors to transfer to uh, uh, investments and returns from investments in and out of the country, and, uh, and, 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 and other uh, related clauses. Uh, now, the evidence, the empirical evidence as to whether these protections do indeed promote investment is mixed. Um, but the point here to, uh, to flag is that, and the point that some of the critics of the system have been picking up on, is the fact that the standard set in investment treaties, particularly the older uh, generations of investment treaties are uh, quite often uh, openly worded. They leave significant room for discretion in the interpretation of those treaties. Uh, a, partic uh, a, a particularly commonly uh, used type of clause is the fair and equitable treatment, uh, whereby states must treat investors, uh, foreign investors, in a in a fair and equitable uh, way. What that means in practice, what sort of conduct amounts to foreign uh, fair and equitable treatment, and what conduct breaches that treatment can form the object of diverse, uh, diverse interpretations. I also want to flag very briefly here that uh, investment treaties contain also other sorts of provisions beyond uh, protection, and in particular some uh, deal also with the uh, admission of foreign investment uh, into 
uh, the territory of uh, the state's parties uh, and treaties have diverse approaches uh, in relation to that. I'm not going to cover that issue during this, uh, during this presentation, but we can discuss that later if, if there is interest. Um, uh, on the other hand, what is worth flagging here is that the, while definitions of investment, what qualifies as investment uh, covered and protected by the treaty, varies depending on the treaty, the formulations are quite often very broad and and uh, land holdings and agribusiness ventures would typically be uh, covered, would be within the scope of in, uh, investment treaties. And indeed, as we will see, there's been a, a growing number of cases uh, brought under these treaties uh, that have a connection to, to land uh, and land governance. So uh, still by way of sort of setting the scene and, and, and introducing the topic, uh, mapping out the landscape, uh, I think it's uh, useful to spend a little bit of time uh, on investor state arbitration because an objection quite often raised uh, in relation to um, uh, international legal arrangements is that they quite often struggle to make a difference on the ground, to have a, a real impact on the ground. Uh, and so the question is, what are the enforcement mechanisms? What sort of remedies exist uh, so that um, uh, that, that uh, enable those treaties to actually uh, make a difference? And, and here is where this uh, arrangement of investor state arbitration comes in. Essentially, uh, uh, under most uh, investment treaties, uh, when an investor feels, uh, believes that the state has breached a standard set by the investment treaty, they can bring the dispute, the investor can bring the dispute uh, to an international arbitral tribunal. Uh, this is uh, a relatively a rather unusual uh, system under international law in the trade context, for example, disputes are primarily, uh, are, are, are disputes are uh, uh, brought by and uh, by states against other states, so a dispute between states, whereas here we're looking at disputes between a private entity and, and, and a state and a government. And it's uh, somewhat similar in that respect to what happens under human rights um, uh, uh, systems. Uh, but on the other hand, under human rights systems, there are a number of requirements to first go to national court and exhaust domestic remedies, whereas that is uh, often not the case under investment treaties. Uh, they have been used quite a bit, investment treaties, and indeed there are about 700 known uh, treaty-based arbitrations worldwide. I say known because it may be that there are others that are not publicly known, and for a long time issues of transparency were major issues in relation to uh, arbitrations. Um, and, and also uh, this uh, use of uh, international investment treaties has affected a wide range of policy areas. Uh, and the way uh, the disputes are handled if uh, and when they're brought is that a tribunal is set up typically composed of uh, three private individuals, uh, lawyers from law firms uh, uh, primarily, um, that are directly or indirectly uh, appointed by the parties. The, specific, the specifics really vary a lot depending on the specific system. Uh, the, the arbitration rules that are applicable, uh, but essentially, if the investor, if the claim brought the investor brought by the investor is successful, then what the arbitral tribunal does is to award compensation. So the government has to pay compensation to the uh, to the investor. Uh, amounts can be quite significant, very substantial compared to what is. Um, uh, possible under many uh, national legal systems. And there are multilateral treaties that uh, assist enforcement of these awards that effectively enable the investor to seize assets uh, linked to the state that are located uh, in uh, essentially in the, vast, in the vast majority of the countries uh, in the world. So there are systems that allow investors to collect the compensation they're uh, due uh, according to these to these awards, so I've just introduced um, uh, somewhat summarily. Uh, uh, I appreciate uh, the issue of land, uh, land rights, and governance, and wh why it matters, and the direction of travel that we are in in terms of international guidance and efforts to implement that guidance, and the implications it can have uh, for businesses, including some financially uh, adverse uh, implications. I've also introduced uh, the international system that aims to uh, protect businesses from uh, uh, adverse uh, state action, uh, action that can adversely affect their, um, their business, their operations. Uh, 
And I'm now trying to bring them together uh, by looking at how land uh, policy measures have come up in uh, arbitrations brought under investment treaties. And, um, and I alluded uh, already to the fact that there are indeed a number of cases specifically concerning land, directly or indirectly, that have come up. Um, uh, and this is not a new phenomenon. It, it dates back a long time, but we've certainly seen a significant number of cases in recent years. The issue of land re redistribution is an obvious arena where a, pot a potential tension uh, can arise because uh, 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 the expropriation of land for redistribution purposes uh, has, a, has an obvious impact on the business and, and indeed investors have challenged a number of uh, measures taken in a land redistribution context, but we've also seen a number of other cases that, uh, that have, um, uh, have been stemming from a wider range of land-related measures, from land privatization schemes, particularly in the uh, um, in uh, um, Eastern Europe, uh, land occupations, uh, land use zoning regulations, uh, particularly restrictions uh, on change of use from agricultural to residential, uh, real estate conversions, also environmental measures that, are, that entail restrictions on land use uh, and land use options. So a, a, a rather wide range of, of, of measures concerning land has come up in, uh, uh, in investor state arbitration so far. Uh, and there have also been some concerns, if not actual cases, that have been raised by some uh, in specific contexts where land restitution has emerged as a key component of a wider process, for example, of transition from conflict uh, so in Colombia, uh, several uh, um, several people have raised concerns about the fact that the land restitution program may, um, may might trigger uh, uh, investor claims based on a number of investment treaties that the government of Colombia has signed over the years. And similar concerns have more recently been raised in relation to Myanmar, another country where again uh, the issue of land is uh, is uh, quite high up on the agenda. Uh, and, and a country that has also signed a number of investment treaties and some people have raised concerns that action in the former uh, action in the land arena may be affected by uh, investor claims based on, on those treaties. Now, in a sense, what the uh, treaties aim to do is to set parameters of quality uh, for state conduct. So they really set some standards that um, are, are, are meant to ensure that government action uh, responds to, uh, uh, so, to key, key para parameters of, of, of quality. At the same time, I think it is important to recognize that these parameters can also have distributive effects. And I think the case of land distribution is emblematic in that respect, but it's really not unique if we think of this wider range of measures I mentioned, ranging from restitution through to various types of uh, land use uh, regulations. Um, and it is true that there will be other legal instruments that would typically protect uh, foreign investments from adverse action, uh, be it uh, constitutions that would typically have a right to property provisions, there would be national legislation on these issues. But what we observe is that the standards set by uh, investment treaties can go beyond what is required under national law. Um, for example, uh, South Africa in the mid-1990s um, uh, was uh, on the one hand uh, uh, had significant negotiations during the transition to democracy and the issue of land uh, and the right to property clause in the constitution was one of the key issues in that negotiation uh, uh, and leading to uh, provisions in the constitution that provide for a number of uh, criteria or elements to take into account with regards to uh, determining compensation. Uh, on the other hand, investment treaties, including signed by South Africa at that very same point of time, they typically tie compensation payments exclusively to, to market value, according to some formula that are quite often uh, recurring in these treaties. So there may be uh, uh, um, uh, different standards of compensation between uh, what is provided for under the investment treaties under national law. There may be also um, 
uh, more far-reaching standards of protection under investment treaties than is the case under uh, under uh, international uh, under national law. And what this does, therefore, is the, is to increase the cost of action uh, for governments and the concern that has been debated now for a number of years, not only in relation to land but more generally, is whether the prospect of having to pay significant amounts of money in compensation uh, to businesses and in fact even the costs that may be incurred through legal fees and other costs in the arbitration process itself, whether that might in, in itself disincentivize a socially desirable action, uh, particularly in countries such as low and middle income countries where uh, public uh, where constraints on public budgets are particularly tight. Uh, so there is uh, there is a, a an, an 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 issue there in terms of interface and the ways in which uh, uh, action in the land governance field. Uh, could uh, could trigger and has been triggering in several cases uh, claims under investment treaties and there is an, a question really as to how the costs of that action are, uh, are spread between public and private actors uh, so who's going to pay for uh, for tighter standards tighter regulation who's going to pay for uh, action that has been determined uh, in the context of land governance um, and, and while this issue is, is not a new issue, uh, if we look at trends in the recent wave of large-scale land acquisitions, um, uh, particularly uh, land deals uh, for agribusiness investments concluded since the year 2000, uh, over the past 15 years or so, uh, we can see that uh, uh, a significant share of those deals are covered by at least one investment treaty. So the relevance of the, uh, of the issue I've been outlining has... Um, uh, is compounded by quantitative evidence that shows that indeed many of the uh, ventures that have been initiated over the past 15 years or so are protected by at least a treaty. Now, just by way of background, you know, we have calculated this. Uh, this uh, we have produced this um, this chart based on data from the Land Matrix. Uh, we have also used data from ANCTAD, which has a repository of international investment treaties. We have cross-checked the two. Uh, so, if one considers uh, investment treaties that are currently in force, then 64% of uh, land deals for agribusiness investments concluded since the year 2000 uh, are protected by at least one treaty. If one also includes uh, recent treaties that have not uh, come into force yet, but might well do in future, then that share increases to 70%. So I think it's uh, clearly there is a significant treaty coverage there, uh, and and uh, and that applies to about a thousand thousand uh, land deals for agribusiness investments that were entered into the land matrix database. So quite quite a few deals, quite a few investments that are protected by 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 these treaties. Uh, so far, we haven't. Uh, there are no known uh, arbitrations that are stemming, that have been brought under investment treaty, and that are stemming from this recent wave of large-scale land acquisitions for agribusiness investments. I again stress the word "known" in the sense that uh, confidentiality uh, issues might mean that. Uh, th there could be arbitrations that we don't know of as yet. There has been one case in which the investor uh, was publicly cited as a, having threatened to go to arbitration. We don't know what happened to that particular case. And also, we don't know whether there have been other cases in which investors have invoked the treaties uh, without going public about it, uh, essentially invoking the treaties to persuade governments or to, dis to dissuade governments from taking certain action, um, but haven't been uh, reported on. Now, I think apart from uh, the, uh, the obvious uh, consideration that more transnationalized land relations would in themselves create more opportunities uh, for uh, uh, more potential opportunities for uh, the activation of investment treaties, that is more land in the hands of foreign investors, everything else being equal can lead to more uh, to more uh, cases being brought, uh, but there's also a number of other factors that characterize this recent wave of large-scale land acquisitions that increases that risk. Uh, many deals were concluded in a relative, uh, relatively short period of time. Um, uh, we did some analysis of some of the contracts a few years back, raising concerns about the quality, at least of some contracts. Uh, many of the investments have failed, so leaving behind a string of disputes and, uh, and frustrations. Uh, there have been strong calls for tightening standards, uh, for better regulation, for rethinking uh, 
uh, the investment models underlying this recent wave of land acquisitions. Also, land being very political in contexts in which there are uh, significant capacity uh, challenges that in itself also increases the uh, risk of uh, exposure to potential arbitrations insofar as the, uh, in, in, in some cases at least public authorities may actually uh, lack the capacity to act in a way that responds, that meets the standards imposed by international investment treaties. So the sort of things that could happen here is uh, government terminating contracts, government renegotiating, uh, government tightening up regulations, and indeed that was the case in the one case where the investor publicly was cited as having uh, threatened to go to arbitration was a case of a government claiming back uh, the vast majority of the land that had been awarded under a concession for lack of um, development according to the time timeline uh, associated with the development plan for that project. But there could also be other uh, types of action, particularly taken by grassroots group, court litigation initiated by activists, and, 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 and other actions that could lead to arbitration claims as well. I think there's a number of uh, issues here, and, and uh, I'm picking, uh, picking on three to, to illustrate the issues that really stem from the fact that the linkages between land governance on the one hand and investment treaties on the other haven't as yet or until now have been properly thought through. Uh, so, for example, um, under international investment treaties, uh, many arbitral tribunals have um, uh, given thought to the issue that investments that were made in violation of national law should not enjoy protection under investment treaties. Now, in a land governance context, um, there's been a lot of debate about the fact that national legislation in many countries uh, struggles to recognize the rights that are perceived uh, to be legitimate at the local level. Uh, and so there may be uh, situations where an investment complies with national law uh, and with national law requirements, uh, but actually is not in line with a standard set by the voluntary guidelines, for example, that explicitly call for the protection and recognition of all legitimate tenure rights, uh, the latter including also rights that are not currently protected by law. Uh, so what happens if there is an investment that does comply with national law but actually ends up in widespread dispossession at the moment based on what we can see in the in the in the arbitral jurisprudence, that investment will be protected under an investment treaty and there is indeed a problem of Whose, whose rights are being protected between the investor that has uh, promoted the, 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 the venture on the one hand and people who have been affected by it. Uh, another example I mentioned before, the uh, standard of fair and equitable treatment that has been relied on uh, in the vast majority of uh, uh, um, investor state arbitrations. Um, so tribunals have interpreted that standard as including as protecting the legitimate expectations that the investor had when they made the investment so essentially if the government makes some representations to the investment to the investor for example reassuring the investor that the land is available that the land is free of any encumbrances that the project should go ahead and the investor invested on that basis uh, and then that that um, that uh, uh, expectation is frustrated, then the investor has a, has a claim under the investment treaty. Now, the question, again, from a, a land governance perspective is there have been many cases where governments have made those sorts of representations before actually consulting with, with uh, villagers and people likely to be affected by that project. Uh, so the voluntary guidelines are very clear in relation to uh, consultation, in relation to FPIC with regards to indigenous peoples. And so what happens in a situation where the law has formally been complied, the investor relied on re reassurances made by the, by, the, by the government, but actually the government had not um, had not consulted uh, before, before making those, those representations. A third example is, uh, is the issue of compensation. I mentioned before that investment treaties quite often tie, uh, quite typically tie compensation to market value. But what we've seen in a land governance context, particularly in, or including in the latest wave of uh, large scale land deals for agribusiness investments, that the governments were making land available at, uh, at uh, below market prices, so in any case, a low, low, low prices. The attempt was indeed to attract investment, at least in the earlier phase of the, 
of the phenomenon to attract investment, to bring in capital, to create jobs and, 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 and all that. But actually, the, 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 the land was not valued at market rates. So if, if indeed there is an issue, if the, indeed there is action that affects the investment, if indeed there is a claim, um, would the government have to pay a market value for something that allocated a below market value? And I think that also creates a number of, a number of issues. So essentially, what, what these various instances amount to, uh, what this sort of lack of consideration of the, the, the link between the land governance space on the one hand and the investment treaty uh, uh, landscape on the other, is that investment treaties and their protections could uh, or risk compounding shortcomings that are primarily rooted in national governments, but then end up acquiring an international significance through the protections provided by the treaties. So what there does, does this leave us, and this is my last and final slide really, um, first a basic recognition that when dealing with land governance and for people that are primarily working on land governance, it's important to recognize that beyond the local and national dimensions of land governance that have been recognized for a very long time, we also need to recognize the international dimensions of land governance, and in particular how international frameworks for, uh, that uh, relate to uh, foreign investment can also come into play and have a bearing on, on land governance arrangements and action that takes place at the local to national level. So making those links, bridging those communities of practice is very, is very important. Second, uh, there's quite a bit of work that, uh, uh, quite, uh, that could be done by states. States are key actors both in international investment treaties, they are the ones who negotiate and sign the treaties, and also in land governance. Uh, and so uh, uh, inevitably a key actor there in terms of thinking through the policy choices um, on, on investment treaties. Uh, should they be signed? If so, what are the objectives that are being pursued? What are the formulations of those treaties that make more sense? And I think over the past few years there have been significant shifts in the formulation of some investment treaties. So there's quite a bit of practice that can be uh, drawn upon in general terms. Not so much, though, in relation to land specifically. I think there's quite a bit of creative thinking that, that could be done here in terms of, for example, linking uh, investment treaties to voluntary guidelines. Would it make sense to refer to the voluntary guidelines and investment treaties? Would it make sense to rethink compensation standards and investment treaties in light also of what uh, countries have been uh, 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 identifying as best uh, uh, as best uh, models, for example, in the national constitution. So better aligning uh, uh, the two. On the other hand, in relation to land governance, uh, there is a need uh, to uh, step up efforts to strengthen, to improve land governance, uh, both because, um, uh, on the one hand, uh, shortcomings in national government, governance can have these sort of repercussions, can have can expose governments to these sort of liabilities, but also in more positive terms, uh, because um, um, I personally think that it would make much more sense to strengthen land governance for all, for everybody, uh, uh, for diverse land users, rather than uh, fo focusing on, our, on arrangements that effectively uh, aim to insulate uh, a certain type of actors, namely foreign investors, from the operation of bad national governance. So I think there is a strong case here for strengthening land governance, uh, rolling out the implementation of the voluntary guidelines uh, in, uh, as a way to uh, to focus as a, as a, as a, as a, as a key focus for, for, for efforts. It's not just a job for governments, though. I think there is uh, quite a bit that needs to be done also by other actors, in particular uh, parliaments and uh, social movements and non-government organizations that have been quite active in, 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 in the land governance space, particularly non-government organizations and, and social movements. Um, there have been growing engagement with the issue of investment treaties in some geographies, particularly middle and high income countries. But actually, there hasn't been very, uh, very much of that happening in lower income countries. And I think there's a need for that, for that greater 
debate greater scrutiny and, 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 and greater pressure to act. And I think that seeing it from an investment treaty perspective, they, these, these treaties are quite often, they can come across as abstract and remote and difficult to understand. And I think looking at them through the prism of land rights and land governance, an issue that really does resonate at the local level, uh, does resonate at the, at the grassroots, uh, it can really provide a vehicle for understanding the real implications that these things can have and, and have a bit more of a more of an inclusive debate about about policy options in that respect. There's a, uh, I think, also a role for research. Uh, while we know much more uh, about this than we did before, we're still it is still difficult to actually identify actual cases where the where these tensions are emerging. Partly because information is not in the public domain, governments are quite often quite reluctant to publicly admit that they are not taking action as a result of. Uh, threats of arbitration and or or, uh, or, uh, or pressure uh, from certain groups. So th there's, I think, uh, the real value there in better understanding the nature of these tensions through more in-depth, uh, qualitative case studies that can shed light on on this. And then finally, uh, uh, last but not least, both in general and given this particular audience, there's a real important uh, role there for donors uh, to support. Uh, innovative action in each of these spaces, uh, each of these spaces, so on land rights, on investment treaties, action that ranges from the national to the international level, but also I think important issue of coordination. There's a, a clear link here to the whole policy coherence for development agenda. How different policies, both in the context of development and in the context of trade and investment. Uh, Needs to need to be thought through in a more integrated way, and the implications of one for the other need to be probably properly factored in. And so, uh, beyond supporting individual efforts, also creating the coordination and creating the synergies between the different strands of action is very important. And I think that's where I see also this webinar as a as a as an important step forward in that respect is to really try and bring together, uh, bridge these different worlds. So I'm, I'm I am um, uh, conscious of the fact that uh, uh, it's on the one hand a little bit of a technical topic, on the other hand I've had to be, uh, you know, given uh, time constraints, I've, I've had to keep the presentation uh, somewhat high level. I'm very much looking forward to your comments, to your thoughts, your suggestions, your own experiences as well uh, for, the, for, the, for the discussion session just now. Thank you very much.